So the, ne the next three talks are going to take us through engagement of T cells and an immune response. Um, so I, I'm going to go quick. Dr. Maloney had touched on bispecific antibodies, and I'll set the stage and then cede it to Dr. Sauter, who's going to talk about CAR T cell, um, the future uh, for us here at Memorial and more broadly. Um, and then Dr. Perales is going to be speaking about allogeneic BMT in NHL. So um, I wanted to touch base on bispecifics, bites and darts, um, because they really may be the modality that's available to those of us in the clinic more readily than a cellular therapy like a CAR T cell, given the toxicity and the need for inpatient care. Um, th there's many ways that we can gauge the immune system. You're going to hear about CAR T cells. You've heard already about uh, the results out at the Fred Hutch. Bispecific antibodies are really a poor man's engager of the T cell that are not dependent on MHC and can be given more like a rituximab with different toxicity profiles. And we'll go over the bite uh, and the data that exists and then how that's being addressed in some prospective studies. And we've heard about immune checkpoint inhibitors. So bispecific antibodies and uh, bispecific T cell engagers, or the so-called bite, um, are an antibody that combines the specificity of two different antibodies simultaneously. In this instance, we're bringing a B cell and a T cell into close apposition, and that physical contact allows for engagement of the immune system without co-stimulatory molecules. Uh, most of the bispecific antibodies have bound to CD19 or CD20 and then CD3 on a T cell surface, although there are sort of plug-and-play technologies available that allow us to start to dial in and mix and match with different effector cells. So a bite um, is a unique uh, bispecific antibody. It's really a single chain variable fragments that are linked together uh, in a flexible construct to give you one-to-one -one antigen binding and valency. Um, these are small flexible molecules, so you're taking the variable regions um, of the two and combining them and getting your um, bispecific. Uh, as a small molecule, uh, and based on some of the physical properties, it did require continuous infusion. Um, these do not require a T cell clone, uh, and they're not specific to the T cell receptor. They're not MHC um, class restricted. And really, one could theoretically make any T cell recognize any surface antigen with such a construct. Um, they, this construct lacks an FC binding portion, although you certainly can engineer a bispecific with um, three binding sites where one actually engages the FC if you wanted to. And depending on what we target, the names change. So bites uh, engage T cells, bikes engage NK cells, uh, so those exist as well, binding to CD16A. Uh, and the mechanism of action here, here's showing a, a bispecific that, or a trispecific that's engaging a T cell, a tumor cell, and all, uh, also retained FC receptor activation um, where you actually can get um, T cell mediated uh, lysis of the tumor cells, and that those co-stimulatory receptors can be engaged potentially um, just through the physical um, connection. These are some of the different constructs that exist. Uh, so this is what we just showed would be a FAB3. Um, bispecific FAB2s are in uh, development. We're going to talk about um, the bite. Uh, there's minibody and tetrabodies, um, as well as dual affinity uh, retargeting molecules. Uh, where these differ really is in the linkage technology, their stability from a chemical standpoint, and like ADCs where the field has moved forward because of advances in the chemistry that allow for the stability and the um, steric um, uh, components to actually be better modified. Uh, the same is actually happening in bispecific antibodies, which conceptually have been around for a long time. So blinitumumab is the agent that's FDA approved in ALL. You saw a little bit of that data earlier. It's targeting CD19 and CD3. Um, and I'll show you the data in non-Hodgkin lymphoma to set the stage um, for uh, a benchmark, I guess, as we speak about um, CAR T cells. Uh, but many other uh, companies are in the field. Um, and uh, Genentech has a CD20, CD3 targeted agent that's in clinical trial here. Dr. Matazar is leading that effort. Regeneron has uh, agents, Zencore has a plug and play sort of technology, um, and we'll show some of that data. So blenitumumab, um, exciting responses in ALL leading to the FDA approval, CR rates that were dramatic at 80 percent. Um, again, mentioning that this was a continuous infusion and associated with toxicity um, that is not for the faint of heart. So the blenitumumab study, uh, phase one in relapsed refractory NHL, 
This was a three plus three design. Um, the patients had follicular, mantle cell, large cell, uh, a median of three prior therapies and were in their 60s. As we mentioned, um, this was a continuous infusion um, and it was given for four to eight weeks or uh, until DLT or progression. Uh, there was a retreatment or consolidation dose for patients who got CR or PR um, and uh, steroids uh, could be given uh, at the investigator discretion. 34 patients were enrolled in a extension study at the MTD and that was at 60 mics per meter squared. And because of neurotoxicity, these studies actually took a while to initially accrue. So we've been hearing about this data for quite a long time. And there was a ramp up, um, I'm sorry, that um, was in the expansion. So what do we see in terms of toxicity? Um, you do see lymphopenia, as you might expect, in terms of engaging uh, CD3 and CD19. Um, but the, the biggest concern was neurotoxicity happening in about one of five patients at a grade three level. And this is uh, generally reversible, but it can uh, present as an encephalopathy, seizure activity, ataxia, um, and um, confusion. So we know that the bispecifics are um, active. They have central nervous system toxicity. The mechanism of that central nervous system toxicity, Dr. Maloney expounded on a little bit, um, and I think it's still not clear, uh, at least certainly to me. Um, there's been attempts to block T cell entry into the blood-brain barrier um, with agents that can accommodate that. Uh, dexamethasone certainly can abrogate some of this toxicity, and we know it's active in the CNS. Uh, let's see. So from a CNS standpoint, we've talked about this uh, predominantly. It's reversible and manageable generally, uh, withholding infusion and using dexamethasone. There's some transient inflammatory irritation to the CNS. Um, and we know that um, the T cells actually are uh, causing some endothelial um, binding. Whether or not that's an IL-6 effect or a direct T cell effect, I think we still are sorting out. This is the reason for the excitement. So the duration of response for patients um, at the 60 microgram per meter squared uh, uh, dose was actually quite impressive. This is actually, oh, forgive me. So this is over a year of benefit in patients with relapsed um, uh, lymphomas. And you're seeing follicular and mantle cell lymphomas as well as some large cell lymphoma patients with ongoing durable responses out to two years. And when we uh, look at that, oh, it's not staying, but the overall response rate um, was impressive in that group. That led to a phase two study uh, with refractory disease, a median of three priors. And uh, there were two cohorts. Uh, there was a hope that they could start with a flat dose. Two out of two patients in that group actually had toxicity and that was closed. So they went to a stepwise progression, again, with a continuous infusion at 928 and then 112 mics um, given daily. Um, and that has demonstrated a confirmation of continued activity. Uh, the median duration of response for those responding was 11.6 months. Toxicity, similar to that phase one experience, we're still seeing about one in five with a grade three CNS toxicity. And this really does seem to be a class effect across the field in terms of agents that engage T cells, whether it's the CAR T cells or bispecifics um, doing so. Um, updated at ASH last year was um, long-term follow-up from patients treated on the initial study. And here you're seeing, um, broken down by age, a group of patients who are out seven years. Um, and this was a total of 22 patients, about 30% of them without additional um, treatment. So clearly an active therapy for a proportion of patients. That 30, 40% of long-term responders seems to be reproducible across different agents. Um, and this is being continued to look forward. Um, at, as an agent. I, I think what was recognized right away, though, was that the continuous infusion was an impediment log logistically, and it didn't take long for additional constructs that had different pharmaco um, uh, properties with longer half-life to be developed. And so um, we have in um, study right now the dual affinity uh, retargeting DART protein. Uh, Dr. Yunus is uh, leading that effort. Uh, and these agents actually are targeting CD3 and CD19. Similarly, we give the initial treatment inpatient, but then uh, if tolerated without neurotoxicity, it set, um, settles into an every two-week IV therapy. In a similar vein, Dr. Matazar uh, is working with a compound that uh, Genentech uh, has developed that's a bispecific antibody directed against CD20 um, as well as CD3. Uh, the, these T cell directed by specifics um, are humanized anti CD20, CD3 molecules, and so they have a longer half life, um, and the dosing is every three weeks with this agent. 
again, we're, I think neurotoxicity is going to be an ongoing issue with these, so it's not actually the size of the molecule that's leading to this as much as the T cell engagement, and we're going to have to learn um, to a greater degree how to, to potentially prevent that as an ongoing occurrence. Um, I'm going to hold questions and let Dr. Sauter come up and speak um, about our CAR T cell program, and maybe we can answer questions together. Uh, thank you.